But, you know, we don't promote ourselves. I would say that now is the time to speak out what we're doing because we can actually say we've been going three years and we have success. So in the house that we have been um, doing a natural deed class, which means a taper, working with their doctor and, and educating them about the drugs so that they can advocate for their own a detox. And then we provide all of the supplements, all of the health that goes into them being uh, strong, be able to get through it in a timely, fast manner where um, they don't need other drugs, but they can still feel like they are healthy and well the whole way through. And so that's what we've been doing. We've had six deaths with the first four clients, all four of them. And now they're, they they actually didn't go to rehab at all. They we did detox and treatment within two months because going into their third month. But I would say, I don't know if that's happened anywhere else where you can actually say that these girls are doing volunteer work, doing part-time work, and they're, fa they're reunited with their children and their families already. And so we think that the model works because it's very intensive. Is that what you were saying you were doing intensive? I think intensive works. If somebody really wants to get well and they're motivated, we can work with them first. But to keep repeating that, you need more workers. You need support for the workers, like financial support. We need um, houses. So right now we um, are leaving the, the situation we're in for another house because um, we realize that. Was, that was a temporary place, and now we need to have a, a, a place where it's our own. Eventually, we'd like to buy a place, but I don't know if that'll ever happen, but why not? And, you know, we, like you, you have places that you've been buying. I think that's what we need to do. We need to have solid, a solid system from beginning with the moss history, all the way through their detox, all the way through their treatment, all the way through their recovery, and then a place where they can spend a whole year recovery. A full year, I believe. To, Nowadays, what I've seen on the street, by the time they come off, they are so traumatized. So, complex trauma is uh, so deep. And especially sexual trauma for women is incredibly deep. And here in Dunning, unfortunately, we have a lot of sexual crime, violent crime, at a level that I've never even heard of. And so I think there is a real need to quickly work with the women off the street. We do um, be talks for men in trailers, and that's about a 50% success rate because trailers are not together in a house, you know. But we do actually have them in a campus now. We've got men overseeing men, which is really cool. Men who come out of addiction are overseeing that, and it, I think it's working. And um, so we've got people that are just going in today, a new person, and somebody else coming out, and. But, you know, they need more time. They need, I believe people need a whole year. So this two month, three month thing is because it's more um, expedient to try to get help to as many people, but it's not actually working. People need a longer uh, term to get help. And so that's what we're trying to do. We don't want to pass them over to others because I find if you can keep them in their own hometown, not near the, the stuff that they're with, but where their families that are healthy can still have relationship with them and their children. This is their biggest carrot to get better, is for their children and the families. And every woman that we're helping all have children. And they all have families that want to support the blind child. And some of them come to our Saturday uh, family support group. But I, I would say that um, we're starting to see the bigger picture right now that uh, it takes a lot of people to help um, these, these people recover. So it takes doctors who will work with us. Not every doctor is going to want to work with natural detox. That's right. Many of them, and I've had discussions, many of them believe that methadone is it. That's the end road. The end game is methadone for the rest of your life. It's your trip. I've always believed if you've been told you have cancer, that's not the end game. The end game is you can get well. So there is a healing journey. Lots of people have been healed from cancer. And I don't think we need to see addictions any different. It, if your son or daughter's an addiction, do you want to hear that they'll be using an addict all their life? No. There's hope for everybody. There's lots of people out there who've made it, right? There's lots of people who have amazing stories. So why should we settle for less? And so I believe if, if we can find the doctors who will work with us, and so when detox, it's just taper. And we is not using drugs to taper, but tapering off of what they were on, doing it with huge health support so we do lots of juicing lots of smoothies all natural organic foods and fitness and clean water like it's really important to have filtered water 
lots of it and have people monitoring it. And we spend a lot of money, hundreds of dollars on supplements. Tons. We find out what they're deficient in, vitamin C. And for men, it's testosterone. They got to get that up. They eat you know, protein. We do lots of protein additions. We don't feed a lot of meat, but we get protein supplement. Because meat is not, it's very acidic, and so is bread, and so is um, dairy. So we really find alternative things to get the to be thoughts. Like, they have full of parasites. They have infections in their body. One person who's living with us, we just found out she's got parasites that are coming out of her pores. That's how bad it is. And many, and she was loaded with sores when she came, like large sores. And so by using colloidal silver, by using aloe, aloe is our biggest friend. Many of them have poor guts. We use, um, uh, what's it called? Uh, Furicut is the company that actually is here locally. They put out some of the best products. So we use their um, probiotics and they've got amazing stuff for um, turmeric, for inflammation. You can get the inflammation down in their body and their brains need healing. So we do a lot of, uh, so they get intensive treatment with us. You know, trying to get them out of bed in the morning is a big, to actually eat and um, feeding them well and, and just, uh, yeah, I mean, I'm excited. I feel like we do have a really successful program now. We just need to be able to get behind the people who are willing to run the program and pay them. We've had volunteers. Try running a program like this with volunteers. So seven people working in a house, it's very hard to coordinate and it ended up being very difficult. But now that we are actually paying two people, Everything's going amazingly well. Two people that are committed and working intensely with them, and then some coming into sub, but under that works really well. So we have no um, income of our own. We don't have a thrift store. We don't have a way, a coffee shop or any way right yet because we've been so busy, tied up helping people. All our time is serving the people on the street. Haven't even had time to talk or spend time you know, educating other people because we're still learning, right? We're learning. We learn from the people on the street. They're the ones that teach us. And then every once in a while I go to OPS and talk to them. I've had terrible, terrible, terrible experiences at OPS. Every time I've gone there, we've had a, three clients that have come there for, they've had to go there because two things happen at OPS. You have a suit team upstairs, you have a room where you can go to get help to get off drugs, and then you have a room where you go where you take drugs. Yeah, the, the safe supply. So what's going to happen to our people as they go there? They'll walk into the room and they'll see their friend taking and they go and take with them. And three of them have collapsed on the floor being taken out by ambulance. All three of them. Three of our clients. Mm -hmm. So that is a disturbing. And so the doctors that worked there last year, they all quit and all at once the same weekend. So then suddenly nobody on the street was able to get a doctor because not every doctor works in addiction. Hardly any. It's a specialty, right? So finding one that'll work with you is very difficult, especially because we don't believe in putting someone on methadone for life. We believe that most rehabs won't even take you if you're on methadone. Some will, but you have to taper. It needs to be on a small dose. But, and also Oxycontin is almost everybody's favorite candy nowadays. So when COVID happened, the drugs weren't getting across the border as well, right? And so what was happening is people needed something. So they started making drugs here on the street. This is what I think happened. Um, so people are having these factories here where they mix these feed balls with fentanyl and caffeine and benzos. Well, how is somebody on the street going to get off that? How are you going to get off benzos without therapeutically being helped? But it takes three months or so. I'm thinking of Jordan Peterson, who was on benzos, and he wasn't told what the benzos would do if he tried getting off of them. You know, you can commit suicide when you try and get off the end of like alcohol, or you can go into seizures and stuff. So he had to go for three months of therapy thing to Russia. He went there to get help. And so the people we're dealing with now are people who, if they take speedballs and stuff, they're getting the benzos. They're getting this street mix, caffeine. And, and when you see people bent over, looking like they're, they're like this, and you come back half an hour later, they're still like that. Those are horse tranquilizers. Those are, those are, I don't know if you have them up where you are. Oh, yeah. But, you know, those are, the people can't think. They can't process. Their body stops moving and they just, like, <laughs> doctor who will work with us because of the doctor that we have for Life on Wheels, she'll take our clients because she's not an addiction doctor. But she'll take them for other things, right? Um, and I'm a health health um, coach, so I can help people with a lot of things. 
but I can tell you right now to get people off the drugs off the street, they're only doing a one week detox in Nanaimo and they do 10 days in Victoria. How do you get people off these drugs? You can't, you have to put them on oxy, but uh, they put them on Dilaudid's. Now people are actually getting Dilaudid's from the doctor, right? So you're getting Oxycontin and Dilaudid's, you're getting a methadone and Cadian and Suboxone. I mean, I saw one person with three, they had they had Cadian, they had methadol, and they had Oxycontin. One person, and he was taking all the other stuff. I'm thinking, what the heck is going on here? So um, there's a lot of drug selling, You're taking drugs and picking the ones you want. You want fentanyl, so they'll sell it. And the doctors are giving it to them. Now, surely the doctors got to know what's going on. Surely. Because they're taking 20 to 40 Oxys. That's pretty high. But the people that have come into us, this is what they're coming off of huge doses of Katie and huge doses about surprise and, and that adults. And they firmly believe that these people will never get clean or audit. And so I just, I can't, I don't want to work that way. I want to help people. I want to help them to completely be clean and free. Because as long as you're still dependent on methadone, you can't really get a job. You really can be dangerous. Your heart's going to fail it actually. So we took a fellow off the street from warm land, freezing in the middle of the winter. He was on high doses of methadone for 20 years. And he was 60 years old. Well, we got him detoxed. He, he went full turkey, but he actually was able to do it because of all those support supplements we gave him. He went to pull turkey off that and fentanyl. He went to rehab for four and a half months. He came back and he had a heart attack. It broke my heart because he was an amazing guy that wanted to help others and with the men's campus that we have. He was working there, volunteering. And we found out when he died, it was, he, he never died of uh, overdose because if you're off and then you take something, you could die, right? That's what the doctors are afraid of, that if they get people clean, that they can die. So that's what they're saying. Mm -hmm. But it's, there's nobody working with these you know, when a doctor, an addiction doctor, helps them out, gets them started, they don't follow up. There's not the proper follow-up. Like, they're away. They're not always around. They're away only on Thursday. You get in the lineup and you don't get to see them because you didn't get there early enough. You, be, you, don't, you can't get into continuity. And so the basics is not there for these people. Yeah, food is there, clothing is there, and now, you know, some people are helping. There's lots of people out in the street helping with sandwiches and different things, but... It's a homeless crisis and opioid crisis. So without taking care of those two things, and I think the opioids, you have to have treatment centers in every single community, at least Amen. one, every single community. And if they don't invest in that and they put money in a museum or an art gallery or something else, I'm just like, no. And if a hospital gets built, that other hospital should be a treatment center. Yeah, so we've been four months in a house where we've been given a wonderful, wonderful place for women to um, detox and, and uh, to move. Well, have treatment and rehabilitate. It's been a hundred percent success. Um, my dream is to have the whole program where we take them in off the street, we get them detox, they do treatment, they go into our own recovery where they can still stay near their healthy family, still clear a healthy community. We create a healthy community around them. We've got a lot of people around them that will take for shopping, that can do volunteer work. So we want that healthy community around them. And then we need shepherding homes. I need shepherding homes and I need more homes to do more recoveries because these people need time. They need at least a year or more. A shepherding home would be when we think that they're really ready to do some, go back to school, do volunteer work or work, um, that they'll take them in their home for a period of time. Could be anywhere from three months to a year. And so they, they have a family that cares about them and then comes alongside them. Yeah, where they feel safe, they feel cared for, and there's a trust, respect, relationship development. Because I think when you're on the street, all connections are broken down, and it's so important to be part of a family. And that's what we are in this house right now. They're operating as family. When I went there today, they're all doing their chores. Some were helping make meals. Like, they're back to being moms again. That's so awesome. And they all have teenage children. So, you know, it's so awesome to see that, you know, and they... They get out for their walks. They, you know, our program is very intensive. It's body, soul, and spirit. All three need attention. And, and people to think, you know, faith isn't important. Faith is very important where you put your faith, you know, where you put your intro. For us, we know how important it is to have faith in God beyond yourself. Someone greater than you is really important, you know. Um, so we don't have a, an access to funding. So all it has been is just us doing this and people coming alongside, here's 20 bucks, here's 50 bucks. And the odd time, 
Uh, I've had someone say, would you speak at our church or Rotary? I don't know if Rotary will do anything, but um, I spoke there and um, I've spoken at some churches and followed up has been some finances. Um, a thrift store has been really good to give us. The one in Shabanis has been very generous. And it's just also every volunteer puts in all, so we're all retired, so we're all putting in our pensions. I mean, I've put in many years of arches, you know, just, just to make this happen, right? To, to, you so into your own vision. You don't expect everybody else to and you not to. So we, we, all of us have so near to it, you know, with our own finances. That's, that's important. And no regrets because we are seeing, we, we, you know, Don, we've known you for quite a while, you know, and Don knows he can come here and he is totally not judged and he can just come here and he wants to share or he wants something to help. We'll, we'll drive people places. I've driven people to Victoria or Malahat. I've driven people back home. Found a guy on a sidewalk one time, just totally laid out and he was very young. I said, what are you doing here on a sidewalk? Don't you want to go home? He said, I'd love to go home. And I took him in my car and drove him home. And his dad came out and met him. It was just so wonderful. <clears throat> and you know, that doesn't happen very often. That was yeah. kind of a freak one off thing. But many of these people, you know, they they don't just need a warm something or other. They actually need someone to advocate for them. How many times I've gone to advocate to get their th driver's license, their, um, their, um, all their paperwork. I mean, how many times do they lose all their ID? And so we do a lot of that advocacy and getting, getting assistance. People come here from Ontario, from Alberta, they have no assistance, that, you know, so we, we advocate for all that. So we do a lot more. Hi, Carolyn. Okay. We do a lot more than that. Uh, she's in the, in the bin, Carolyn. And um, we literally will go visit their families. When we had pregnant women, we had, were working with five pregnant women who were in addiction on the street. I would literally go visit their families and help their families. So I do that. If a lot of families now have people that are under 19 years old in addiction and there's no help for them. So I go visit them and help them to how to help their children or grandchildren. So I use um, smart recovery. I think that there's so much we can do but it has to be coordinated and that takes energy. So I am, I must say, I am feeling a little overwhelmed that every time I see somebody with a need, you gotta, you gotta help them. They have to know that somebody cares, right? And so we need a better team. We need more people like that. We have people that round up with their friends clothing. I mean, all my family have given financially, all my grandsons, they tied all their money to this. It's amazing. My children, my um, friends, they've all put into this because I believe in it. I can tell you right now on the streets in Duncan, if people knew what were happening here, they'd be a lot more concerned about what's happening here. All of these people that are in addiction are vulnerable, and many of them are in addiction because they've been injured or because of trauma. But, you know, they are people that don't want to be in addiction. They don't want to live on the street. And so, I think it takes a massive effort to look, be honest about it. Is harm reduction really helping them? You know, what they need is people to believe them, that with the right care and help, you know, um, they can do it. And so some people have to open up private places. And ours is kind of like private in a way because we're doing our own thing. We can't even work with the government. Yeah. We can't even work with the medical system here. I can't even get the doctor's help, except for a few, but they're not specialists. So. Fortunately, the suit team here is fantastic. I phone them up and I say, can you get some box in here right now? Because somebody's gone through two days of withdrawal, we're ready to go on that and then supplicate. Because to me, that is one of the best things I can offer someone who can't do it the whole way without something. At least box and supplicate, yes. I won't use anything else. Those are the only two that I would use if somebody wanted to depend on that because most people can put stay on some box of the rest of really like that's not that's not their goal. Their goal is to get, I mean, I, but I would say we're still working on it. There's lots we, more we could do. We could spend a lot of money on detoxing people. There's so many things you could do to detox people fast, like get it out of their system. They have a lot of parasites. Why these people have not a clue how much parasites in their system, why their gut is so unhealthy. They're eating sugar. You live on sugar. You're feeding bad bacteria. You'll never have a good gut. You'll have a leaky gut. You'll never be healthy and your brain won't be healthy. So the two go together. So you can deliver people from drugs, but they gotta get healthy, you know? So there's, I mean, I, I would like to help treatment centers learn how to have a healthy protocol for these people. 
And it's really important because I've been to rehabs that they don't allow them to bring any vitamins in, no supplements. So I have to, I have to convince them that my clients have to have these supplements, you know, and they're like, well, you know, and we're just like, they're deficient in B vitamins, B12, selenium, magnesium, you know, they need their omegas, their brain seed healing, you know, like these people actually need their blood tested to see what their hormone levels are like. I mean, these drugs just deplete them, right? And you're going to help them. We better put in something there to reinforce what you're doing, right? But I, I definitely believe that. Um, we're just a small peanuts, but if anybody's really interested, I could even, if they have someone in your home that's an addiction, which I'm working with a few people that do right now, they're doing the um, detox in the home. We can do that too. They don't have to come into our centers or failures. We can do it right in their home. I'm Doug McKenzie. I grew up in, in Duncan. I moved here when I was one years old at six, 1966, and our family stayed. I moved away when I was 21. So I grew up here with untreated alcoholism and drug addiction, and I didn't even know that. Actually, I went to treatment in 1989, and I've been in recovery for 34 years. And I've worked in the industry uh, for 30 years as an executive director or manager or owner. Now I have a 20-bed private facility in Kelowna, and um, we're fully registered with the province of BC. We just did a five-bed provincial contract for three years for people that can't afford that we can offer. And we're also working with um, right now women when with children, there are high priority to get them back. So it's pretty interesting how times have changed in, in some areas, but you know, the problem with the drug pandemic has been not addressed for so long that the multi-layer problems are now are being happening out of so many areas of mental, physical, spiritual, emotional. You know, before when I went to treatment, I had some of those things, but they were very elementary compared to what's going on today and they needed the type of people to you know, get me back on the straight and narrow, but today it takes so much. And I've come back to Duncan for years. My family's still here. Um, part of my family is still alive, we're still here. Yeah. And I've given away four treatment packages. Um, you know, they put over $100,000 back into the community. Um, I took Whistler Street, that was a well-known street for a lot of problems, and I raised money to put a $20,000 fence up. We painted the buildings. Um, we went and painted the, I always joke, the ugliest building on the strip, which was the old pet store. That was my landlord's Chinese store, Ed Chow, and my dad helped build it, so I, I finally got to paint that. I think I painted it more rather just to paint that. Now I think it's one of the nicest buildings on the strip. <laughs> and I'm doing a charity event right now with me where I challenge everybody called Unity and the community to go to local businesses and support them and spend money there and do what we can. Um, because without businesses in the community, we have no community. And um, they need to sell businesses for charity and all kinds of tax base and on and on. I've been working with North Couch and um, the mayor and Rob Douglas for over a year, you know, about a year now, doing student calls and telephone calls and person calls. And I'm trying to head into the direction. I mean, when you have a system like in Duncan right now, we have a, it's a safe system in every city, but we have a lot of street disorder and we need to start to that street disorder in street order. And what that means is to, chronologically start working with agencies like here and all the other agencies and, and getting working together, find out the pieces that are missing, put those pieces in, find out where they need help, get them the help they need. So not only are they working, we eventually get them all maximum, working at their maximum. And then pretty soon, my goal isn't just to get Doug, ducked on North, North Couch and through the crisis, is to become a blueprint of how other small communities can, can get and you know, like I said, I didn't get clean to just live a very boring life. I didn't get clean just to live a simple life. I suffer from dreaming big dreams. And, but with that, you gotta do the work. I live a phenomenal life today as a result of the work that people did with me and the work that I did with myself. And I tell people I wouldn't be where I am today if it wasn't for people helping me. So it's my responsibility to go back and help because that's how it works. We need to do this together. And that's why the event's called Unity in a Community. What I often see is all these different agencies are hodgepodge trying to do what they can and they interfight as soon as money or things enter and cross-reference and we need to, you know, not have those boundaries or barriers. We need to be united. And if we could take a place like Duncan, which I believe is still small enough that we actually can put these things together. And if we lose the fight, we have nothing to lose because you know what, if we don't do nothing, 
this problem is if, you, if they don't like it now in the community, they're not really going to like it in three years. Right? So we need to start somewhere. That's neat. So I've dedicated part of my time and part of my life to come back and see if I can help with some of this street disorder. I don't know if I can, but I'm, I'm willing to look at all the puzzles and see if we can't put some of those puzzles together and build a team. And the team is everybody who's been affected. That could, that's who qualifies to be on the team. No matter how you've been affected, you're part of the team. And then if we can get that team working together, we can overcome all of the other little things. Like, you know, it's easy to know the nature of the problem, we see it. But we want to find out what's the nature of the solution and then work to get there. And what I love about stuff like this is we deal with our own time and money. Whistler Street, I did with our own time and money. Unity in the community is our own time and money. Giving away treating beds is our own time and money. I believe true community is built, unfortunately or fortunately, however some people might think it's unfortunate, but to me it's fortunate. Community is really built with our own money and our own time. You know, back in the old day, if I was um, running out of something and uh, my mama would say, run over and get the sugar from so-and-so, I admit, right? You know, I had to run over and get some milk or do whatever. Like the true meaning of community was to help each other out. And we didn't wait for no government or, or handouts, right? So for my philosophy is we need to get everybody in the community involved to donate or give their time and money because that's, we can't wait for the government, you know? By the time they come along, whatever they offer us, we're gonna need 10 more of whatever they gave us, right? But for instance, we can do this stuff. You know, what they're doing right now is real. Somebody comes in, they get help right now, <laughs> right? Otherwise you're gonna have to be out on the, in the side right there cold you're not going to get anything you're not going to get some hand warmers like we can do this stuff right now and it makes a difference you know you don't have to be that educated to say it's a difference right 100 percent. we don't have to be educated when i see someone sleeping out there do i offer him more of that or do i offer him a pot like on trunk road even the most uneducated worst student in grade one would pick the pot right you know we need to not become numb to these societal problems we need to start really I think if um, people would see the results of the effort then their their passion would want to help out but unfortunately they're too busy driving by and not stopping and not understanding or not getting it but if if it starts to affect them then they'll they'll stop and say oh what do you guys do here my like next next thing they're gonna pull 50 bucks out of <laughs> and they're gonna do something or oh wow my daughter or loved ones are passionate right so the nice thing is that I get to come back and maybe help to put some order in the dis street disorder. And what I'm doing right now is getting to work in and build the relationships with all the different organizations that are doing what they can to see where they're at, meet their needs. Because as they listen to their that clientele, I, I mean to listen to the, their clientele so we can understand where the order is and where the disorder is. And then that way we can get a solution, right? And like I said, we got nothing to lose if it doesn't work. I made some good friends and we helped out some people. I think it's I a great vision. It's a great idea to yeah. try to tie it together. Yeah. We are working with the food bank. They, they send clients to us and we, we ask for help from them at times. And we work with the suit team. I'm trying to work with the OPS doctors. It's not easy, but I'm stuck with that. So I'm making my best with that. But he's right. And I've gone to Warmland and tried to work there too. We are trying, but we're not accepted because we are not a charitable organization. We are grassroots organic and that's not acceptable at some people's level. So uh, we still, we haven't been invited to this. That's right. You've been left out. But the nice thing with action is, is you don't always need to be right. necessarily. We're independent. Yeah. Super close. We just got to understand what each role is playing. Yeah. And as long as each role is moving forward and, and each role are getting um, assistance of needs met, yeah. then pretty soon it's like, oh, okay, you know what? Maybe Warren Lines is running better all of a sudden. Or maybe the OPS, OPS site is running better all of a sudden. You know, we've seen it with the Trunk Road um, program. It's running pretty good right now. You know, it's uh, a lot cleaner. There's some order in the disorder. And you know, there's some management going on, right? So you need to take that management and start duplicating it. And to be successful, if you take something that's unmanageable, we gotta make it manageable, right? And then how would people, are you doing this on your own or it's part of it? On my own at the moment. So I've been fortunate enough to be able to be invited in by 
people like Rob Douglas and other people, plus just doing it on my own. It all started for me doing it on my own, and then other people caught on, like the Duck and Rotary Club and other people. I believe you lead by attraction or other than permission, the people will come, and that's really what's, that's what's happened. happening. And, you know, so back to the true meaning of community is based on attraction rather than promotion, right? So if I go out and they see me sweating my ass off, I brought my kids and grandkids here, I made them paint seven days a week in the hot sun all the way to Kelowna. And they're like, what the hell are you doing, Grandpa? I said, you're going to learn what it's like to give time and money. And if you don't have money, you're giving your time. And if you got both, you're giving both. Because that's what community is all about, right? We have a lot of time in that way, I believe. Yeah. Like yeah. my family and kids too, and not yeah. promoting. People say, well, how come we don't know about you? Well, we're so busy doing what we're doing. We and then as a result of you guys doing that, that attraction brings other people. And then all of a sudden, call it God god centeredness or whatever you want to call it but people show up and all of a sudden say i kind of like that cause i got a little bit of free time i'm gonna like offer something right and then all of a sudden there's another half a teammate and then another quarter teammate and then a full-time teammate and then you know before you look at it and you go well we got a little system running here right so i think that we start back in the community of being a truck and of doing the work ourselves first it's the sugar <laughs> right but when you finish whatever you're making give me a piece yeah. <laughs> and you know all those fun things right so society can get really numb today that's right right and you know the problem is is they start yelling at the government but the government doesn't listen so then they get more number they call in the police the police don't come they get more number they go to emergency they don't get dealt with so they get more of them so it's really just like everything else to kind of go back to grassroots so yeah. Well, those guys aren't helping, so it's you and me, right? And then we find out that's the richest kind of help there is, right? I would like to add something that's come up this year to me, is that I feel for the first time unsafe. For the first time in Duncan, yeah. I went to a very unsafe situation last Friday, and I was scared out of my wits by a homeless person that was really high, and, and they wanted my help, but as they're banging on the blowtorch in their hand and cornered me in the motor home that I was going to help. That was the first time I felt so trapped. And this person was so high, but I was invited in by somebody else who was looking after that person. But, you know, and I, when I heard the stories behind that person's life and stories of some of the girls that we have, the violence, the level of violence in this community is extremely high for women on the streets here. I want to get every woman off the street as fast as possible. Um, I All I can say is men are getting it too, but there are actual people here who I believe are hired to come through and beat up on the street people. They're driving in vans, they have lead pipes and bats. I've heard of so many of these stories now, and there's a sex crime ring here too. One of them's in prison right now. The other one was murdered, but there's still others I know that are in charge of the sexual violence, predators, and sexual gang. And some of the women we've been trying to help for a long time, I've had a list of many, many over 20 women, they're all being pulled into that sex ring, and so I can't even help them now. Yeah. And so we can't help them easily. They're pulled in, and they're being violated over and over and over again. It's happening in the hotels right here, the motels. And, and so crime has come in, all this stuff. So I'm literally thinking, are we in, in danger of some of our volunteers? Because we work right here and we know what's going on too. So is that putting us in danger as well? Because a lot of the, there's a lot of money involved in drugs. And young people are now involved in selling the drugs or using young people. And I'm lately been finding out 17 year olds, 13 year olds, 15 year olds are now on federal, are now. Um, on cocaine and alcohol, and we can't actually help them. They're underage, you know, not directly in our detox program or anything, but there's not much out there for them. But it's happening at that level. A lot of sexual crime, they're trying to take these girls. We helped rescue one the other day, but it's just a young girl. But it's pretty serious here in Duncan. Yeah. And so I do feel that there is a place we have to be very careful now. I never had that feeling before, but I would say now I do feel uneasy now. Sometimes we like to talk that eventually by doing what you're doing and what I've learned through what I've been doing is wisdom starts to come in and discernment, yeah. And and, and some instincts start to come in yeah. and some protection starts to come in, some spiritual prevention and stuff yeah. like that. But you do got to be very aware and, and keep all your antennas up and yeah, I, I don't want to say I'm I'm afraid to do anything. I just realized there is some serious danger out there. Yeah, for sure. You know, 
So, do you do you want to be contacted? Like, do you want to work with them all to contact? Yeah, anyone's willing to contact me. You know, that's how the t team builds. If they see the traction, then they'll want to be part of it, right? And the you got to get the word out that yeah, I'll just whatever we can do to help the street disorder go to order. We need as many people as possible. I to love that vision. All right. And, um, so how would one reach out to you? Yeah. So I can get, give you my phone number and supply okay. and, uh, um, just put that on. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. If we have all your questions. Well, yeah. <laughs> so does everybody else yeah. in Dyson uh, you know, get phone calls? <laughs> it's just nice too for organic newspapers and news outlets like yourself, you know, that isn't so censored and stuff like that. And it's real. It's right here. It's local. Uh, you can tell the true story of what the grassroots movements are really doing to try to make a difference, mm -hmm. right? Because it's needed. You, know? yeah. you guys are part of the solution. Yeah. yeah. Yes. Thank you for all that. Like you as a community. As a community. <laughs> yeah. All you were. Yes. Different parts. Exactly. Yeah. Thank you both. Yeah. Thanks so much for all you do. It's easy. What more to come? I mean, yeah. it's not like you said, I, I see the lawlessness coming in now, so I don't see a very quick turnaround or improvement. It's more yeah. saving as many lives as fast exactly. as possible right now. I feel it's now at point, how many lives can we save in the next five years? Yeah. Because when I saw how many died in Duncan 27 last year, no, it wasn't. It was way more than that. Yeah. That's just overdoses. Look at all the people that died uh, from heart failure. I had two of my clients by a heart failure, yeah. and they die of murder. Yeah. A lot of these are not overdoses, there's murder. And so that's not 27 people died here, it's a lot more than that. Yeah.